Before we get started with today's podcast, we'd like to ask returning listeners to leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you really enjoy it, share a link to this podcast with friends or family who would enjoy hearing our weekly discussions about basketball and basketball culture. Now, on to the show. Yeah, this is amazing. When Michigan can keep this game to a 19-foot, 9-inch game inside that three-point line, it's all there. Welcome to the 19.9 podcast. I am Aaron Meyer. Today I'm joined by the Chucker, 19.9's resident historian, and I'm thrilled to welcome current author, productivity coach, former Iowa State and NBA hooper Paul Shirley, one of my favorite basketball storytellers of the past 20 years. Uh, what's going on, Paul? I'm all right. I feel a lot of pressure with that introduction. <laughs> you, you have had just a, a, a winding road. We we call this series kind of uh, humbly the Chucker uh, tagged it Tales from the Bench. I think that maybe Tales from the Bench fits you since the the where I first uh, heard about you was riding from the bench on the Phoenix Suns. I think for your first for your first book. All right. So the Chucker might think I was going to start this podcast maybe with some Iowa State questions, but uh, I wanted to talk uh, 1980s uh, Kansas. City Royals. Were you a Royals fan in the '80s? I'm hoping the answer is oh, yes. Oh man, we could uh, we could go all day get into a little Dana awards and some yeah. Buddy Biancolana. Oh my god, a little Quisenberry. The... How about a little Quisenberry? Uh-huh. <laughs> I had uh, one time I was going. I went to a Royals game when I was probably 13 or 14. I had, my parents had had our last brother, who is 12 years younger than I am, and I had bought for him at the game a bib. A Kansas City Royals bib, and Dan Quisenberry was in the crowd, yes. and I got him to sign my youngest brother Tom's bib. Oh my gosh! <laughs> How, do you still have it? Is the question then? Man, I bet he just bombed it all over it. And <laughs> made it I should have had him sign. A, I should have had him sign the back of it. Yes. If I've been thinking. Didn't think that through. <laughs> <laughs> Did Quisenberry sign it in like the submarine style? Yeah, he's like, I got to get down and low like, for this. The uh-huh. That's, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, the, uh, the Kansas City Royals were my first love, and that meant that when the Royals won the World Series in uh, 2015 again, it was weird, like weirdly reconnected to me to loving spectator sports. Like nice. as you can imagine playing for so long i kind of lost sight of why people care about watching sports and Mm. and those runs the royals had made me remember why no doubt no doubt that was that was fun (laughs) so the the second part i wanted to go i want to jump right right into the novel and when uh you've got a book out here you why don't you introduce it because uh you got you've probably practiced this up and i want to hear a little bit about it then i can tell you my first impression of it because i was worried about sharing my first impression but then i read read the little blurb that came in your email today and it and it called my fear so i'll let you introduce okay, it good. first good <laughs> um so this uh this novel it's my first fiction of course um and uh it's about a kid who finds basketball as a way to fit in after his mom uh, moves him and her from Reseda, california to a small town in kansas um with the help of a basketball coach who kind of takes him aside, the, the main character, Gray Taylor, uh, figures out that he has a chance to finally be a, a, a person who's of some value because uh, because he's playing basketball. And then he also kind of needs to save the town from itself. It's a dying Midwestern town uh, that has sort of lost sight of like what made it special. And this kid shows up from L.A., right? And he's like, you guys have this, you have the kind of this amazing thing here. Why are you uh, overlooking it? Um, so it's it's a story about basketball, but it's also a little bit about community. Um, and really, if you want to break it down, it's also kind of a reverse karate kid. I even use like yes. so the karate kid ends up in Reseda. And so my characters leave Reseda to go back to small town, <laughs> Kansas. Uh, so it's a pretty it. deliberate uh, uh, homage. Yeah. So I, I, the first thing I wrote down uh, after I was reading it is uh, it's like a reverse karate kid. But then I had uh, this moment. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Frasier, but they get this because mm, sure. you gave this. You were nice enough to give us a copy a little ahead of time. And they they stumble into this copy 
copy of this author that they that they really enjoy and read it and then tell him it's like Dante's Inferno and he like throws it out the window. So my fear was I'd be like, Paul, I really loved it. It's like a reverse karate kid. And you'd be like, oh, my God, I didn't realize yeah. that. That, nice. that is not what I was yeah. going for. Just be like, I'm cancel, so cancel the release. You- <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you had that uh, same thought. Yeah, um, so. it's, it is. I mean, this is like real inside baseball, but it, it is interesting how spending, you know, it's been six years working on this book. And in the last year, thinking so much about how to describe it for people, mm-hmm. you know, we were talking before we went on about the uh, the changing nature of publishing. And I think part of that is like you have to get so good at describing it very quickly for people like what is this thing mm-hmm. why do i care about it yeah what's the, what's the, the elevator what's the pitch? pitch in the business um someone once described um pre- the movie predator to me they said this is the elevator pitch for predator it's jaws in outer space and that's what it is right and so like you're exactly right that i think being concise especially in publishing today is so critical and mm. you know paul that's something i wanted to ask you about so you had done and we're going to talk later about your two nonfiction books um, really rooted in your basketball career, but w- talk about what kind of drove the the interest in writing a fiction book. Some of it is just my own childhood nerdery of loving <laughs> reading as a kid. Like that was my first love. Um, that's the way that I escaped from little town in Kansas. Right? Was that mm. I read these books by people who had traveled widely and and experienced a bunch of different things. Um, and as my basketball career was ending, I realized that I had a chance, probably not by coincidence. Um, to do for other people what somebody had once done for me, right? Which is to allow them to connect to just a sense that there are other worlds out there. Um, When it comes to fiction, I think I also realized like there's only so much you can say about yourself. Um, And interestingly, I think you can tell more truths in fiction sometimes because there's the ability to create characters who are a little bit more a distilled version of some piece of yourself or some, piece of a person you've met um, that allow you to examine things in a way that feels comfortable to people without them feeling like they maybe are being attacked by a, the direct observation. You know, yeah. and as, as an educator, too, the we emphasize fiction a lot for students because it helps people to develop empathy. I mean, when you can feel what those characters are feeling or put yourself in there. And it's just, you mm-hmm. know, when you're the way that you're describing the town or what he's going through, it's something that a young person could connect with, too. So I'm not sure, again, who you're shooting for, but I definitely saw that as a possibility for this for this book, too. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, and you make a, an interesting point about like, who is it for? Um, when I started, it was aiming a little more young adult. Um, and as it grew or as it developed, I realized that there are a lot of books I read. I'm actually reading this um, Neil Gaiman book right now called The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Mm. Um, and the protagonist is a kid who's seven, right? Um, I think there's value in books that are about our younger selves, uh, even when they're not necessarily, uh, targeted at us. So this is like, you know, I think it's very readable for a 12 year old. If that 12 year old is a pretty decent reader, but I think it's also (laughs) very readable for a sports fan or for someone who maybe like looks back at, um, their own childhood with some level of wistfulness uh, Mm. of like a a slightly simpler time Um, and not to be too soapboxy here, but like, I think uh, one of the things I wanted to get across, especially after having lived in LA for so long is that I think a lot of smaller places do have this inferiority complex Hmm. that they're not worthy. Um, And uh, I want to remind people that there's a lot of value in the tradition of a beautiful hometown gym, um, a Mm. library that uh, that takes you places Um, in that way. It's you know, there's a there's a certain like Harry Potter element. Like we all (laughs) love getting to go away to Hogwarts and see like this magical <laughs> yeah. land. Um, and I wanted to, 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 in my way, recreate that, but just in a... I mean, small town towns might be more alien to the majority of the population now than big cities were, you know, at the time, you know, back in the, back yeah, in the day. I thought you were going to say then, then Hogwarts. And I think <laughs> maybe that's that too, maybe yeah, that too. Like, yeah. <laughs> LA person more They've familiar probably with seen Hogwarts, more of Hogwarts than a small town. <laughs> right, right, for sure. <laughs> so, Paul, you know, one of the interesting things you just said, I think it's an interesting segue in our conversation here today is you talked about how in writing fiction, you're able to put yourself into these worlds, right? And then you saw the opportunity uh, with your earlier nonfiction books to kind of bring people into like 
the the elite basketball world, right? And mm-hmm. so much of what we do on the 99 podcast is trying to bring fans of college basketball into these kind of behind the, the curtain, so to speak, and to bring them into the locker room and, and the personalities and the, and the people who kind of were part of some of these really memorable teams. So as we kind of dig into that a little bit, I'm talk a little bit about how – your recruiting process and how you ended up at Iowa state to begin with, because there's this chapter in stories I tell on dates, you know, your, your nonfiction book um, where you talk about Kansas and Roy Williams. And so talk about just kind of how you even ended up at Iowa state to begin with and and the metropolis that is Ames, Iowa. (laughs) Great question. Um, It is uh, it's one of those stories that uh, is too long to tell on a podcast and, uh, and, and mostly interesting to me and to my family. <laughs> so I will do the short version of it because we'll spare your listeners the whole thing. Um, I grew up in a very small place, the population 700, um, gravel driveway, wow. all of the things that you would see in a uh, Hoosiers uh, sort of set. Um, and as part of that, I think, uh, and forgivably for a lot of coaches, um, I was often overlooked. It was assumed like this is just some kid from a small town who beats up on other little small town <laughs> kids. Uh, so there's no way he's going to end up um, worth a damn. Um, that was frustrating to me and to my family, I think, because I would go places and play well against guys who were highly recruited. Um, but it just didn't seem like it ever connected. Um, as you alluded to, I did have some contact with the University of Kansas. Um, I, both my parents had gone there and that was my dream. If it's not the 1985 World Series that made me happy as a kid, it was the 1988 <laughs> National Championship when yes. Danny Manning took the uh, Kansas Jayhawks all the way when it comes to like favorite childhood memories. So I was I loved the University of Kansas would have done anything to go there. Um, Kansas, though, was a little uh, arrogant for my tastes. Uh, Roy Williams <laughs> sat me down. And at the time I was being recruited by Davidson and loved the head coach at Davidson. But uh, I think Roy Williams was trying to, to do a favor to Bob McKillop, who's a great guy, mm. um, and push me to go to Davidson. Um, so he said, like, you're just the problem is you're just not good enough to play in the Big 12. Oh. Um, and I think that I already had a bit of a fire <clears throat> lit under me by the fact that I'd been overlooked for so long. But that really lit a fire under me. And so at the time, uh, Iowa State was also in play. Technically, uh, Iowa State didn't have a scholarship, um, but I was a national merit scholar, um, which allowed me to go to Iowa State for free, even without a basketball scholarship. Nice. Which was a good deal for Tim Floyd. I remember <laughs> he told us. You got a lot of like, that. Well, you can't, yeah, you can't come here because we don't have any scholarships. And then my mom did some research and found out I could go for free. And we were able to call Tim Floyd and be like, would you like to have a player for free? <laughs> which is a deal you really can't turn down. Yeah, coach is um, not so trying to Iowa that. State under the sort of the cover that uh, the, my one condition was nobody could know that I was a walk on um, mm. because I knew even at 18 that if I, if I allowed that I was a walk on that people would probably treat me differently and, and sort of assume that I wasn't worth a damn like those coaches had back mm-hmm. in Meriden. Um, and uh, from there, I, I, I had a kind of the perfect college career when it comes to the timing of things Uh, i got to play a little bit as a freshman not a lot but that iowa state team was actually really good it was kelvin cato and Mm -hmm. Willoughby went to the sweet 16 my sophomore year we were awful (laughs) and i got to play a lot and then tim floyd left which sucked because i Uh. am still close with coach floyd um and was you know disappointed by that but then Spent a red shirt year getting bigger and stronger. And then my last two years, we won the Big 12 twice and never lost again to Kansas. Man, that, that's, that, that has to feel good to be able to say that. you Because they can't take that away. No, that was it was pretty nice. I mean, I sometimes forget, you know, when you're in the harem scarum of the day to day. Yeah. And you're like, have I accomplished anything in my life? Um, <laughs> you but, can go back uh, to Kansas feelings, and say that. And, and people, yeah, people of, remember of, of like not only beating Roy Williams at Allen Fieldhouse, but also getting to stare him down after the games, because like I don't have there's I have no reason to pull punches at this point. Like Roy Williams <laughs> is an arrogant piece of shit. Like he's he gives everybody this like aw shucks like thing, but that dude is so slimy and just I I yeah. have no patience for Roy Williams. Yeah. Amazing recruit, recruiting story. I, I, I'm always like astounded by just the, the hoops because there's so much pressure and so much uh, that goes into like putting a team together for, for coaches. Um, Chucker mentioned that, that this isn't 
it's too long to be on this podcast, but you did have uh, a lot of that on your podcast. So I want, I was curious, it's a book too, but you turned it into a podcast and I, I was just kind of curious where the idea com- came for that and what the process was like developing that. Cause it's almost, it's almost like an audio book, but it's a little bit, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it has like a different feel to book. it. Yeah, it is. I heard Malcolm yeah. Gladwell no, talking, that's... talking about that with his, uh, new books, the way he like puts an interview in there and sounds and just, vo- just different. Mm-hmm. Voices and it really changes the dynamic of it. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a credit to Rich Berner, who was um, actually the producer of a podcast that I did with Justin Halpern uh, called okay. the Short Corner Podcast, where we talked about the NBA. It was yeah. Justin being a fan and me shooting holes in his fandom um, just on a weekly basis. <laughs> but uh, when Rich. Uh, and his uh, partner at the time, John, got a hold of the story they tell in a date's book. We had talked about like doing an interview podcast where I would like talk to people about the stories they tell on dates. Yeah. Um, hmm. But then as he started to read the book, he's like, I think this we, I think we could do something here where we're just like just having the stories kind of exist on their own. And like you said, they got voice actors and mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of like sound production. Um, it was really, you know, this was only what, three or four years ago, but even then it was a little bit ahead of its time yeah. uh, as far as just the quality of the listener's experience, I think. Um, I have a really <clears throat> good podcasting voice, I'll be honest, <laughs> so that helps. Um, but with Humble that brag. said, it was a, a lot more of their work of like, just creating these kind of soundscapes that made it really fun right no no doubt and uh if if anybody uh doubts it then they they need to listen to the one uh where you're in the bulls game and what is it you rupture your spleen and uh the, yeah. just, that, whole, that whole thing i was like oh yeah, my you want a little, gosh uh, you want a little it's, it was yeah, incredible. A little basketball mixed with some uh, some physiology. <laughs> that and the, some of the sounds that they put in there, I was like, "Oh man, don't maybe not while you're eating." <laughs> so you know, one of the things you just mentioned there, Paul, was kind of poking holes in his fandom. Um, and mm-hmm. one of the things that I saw you write talk about before is the nefarious sides of the machine of college basketball. And I want to get a sense of just of what you mean by that. Mm. Well, it, I mean, uh, people are kind of aware now of how dirty college sports are, I think. At least I hope they're aware. I mean, a few FBI, you know. Yeah. Done um, yeah. And, and I think it should be mentioned that, that dirty is, is also kind of a questionable term because mm. a, in a lot of cases you're talking about like – this forced amateurization of athletes who should probably be getting paid a whole bunch more than they're actually getting paid. Um, And so it's, you know, we start to, it's easy to malign people um, for doing stuff that they probably would do if it were a free market economy anyway. Um, I just like, I think it's, it's just a lot less fun and uh, innocent than people want to believe. And Mm. um, there are times where I get in trouble because I talk about like being at Iowa State was like being in the military. And Mm. there's just no two ways about that. In some ways it was probably rougher than being in the military. I mean, I don't mean military (laughs) like being in Iraq, but like if when it comes to like basic training types of situations and psychological warfare that was dished out by our coaches, it was pretty rough. And, And that means that I'm not, like just in a childlike way grateful for that experience which i think is what people want me to say often Mm -hmm. because a lot of times they're they're imagining well if i could have continued to play the high school basketball that i got to play which was you know for the most part probably pretty fun for all of us we all you know there we had maybe a a sadistic coach here and there but in the in general case, it was it was fairly fun and innocent. And they tend to think that college would just be an extension of that. Uh, when in fact, college is college sports, especially basketball and football, I think are just a lot more like poorly run professional sports organizations. <laughs> like in the pros, you couldn't get away with a lot of the stuff that happens in college because the guys are adults and they'd be like, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. You can't treat me like that. But because of the way college sports work, where the player has very little agency over their career and their options, uh, coaches are able to amass so much power over the players that it it can become 
really rough on those players. Um, I look back at the injuries that I had when I was in college, the way that I played through injuries. I had, I so vividly remember um, one year, I had, I had a kind of a history of stress fractures, which was probably from overtraining. Um, and uh, at some point, one of my stress fracture experiences, I had gone to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you, you'd have another stress fracture in your, I think it was my pubic bone, which is a weird <laughs> place. That's where your hamstring attaches to your, sorry, not your hamstring, your, uh, you like your quad. quad. Yeah. Where's the, where's the attaches sound effects, to your, <laughs> Yeah. It attaches to your uh, pelvis. Anyway, it hurt a lot. And, uh, and so when they said that to me, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to sit out for some weeks or whatever. And I remember Larry Eustachy saying, well, it's great news about your injury. And I was like, wait, what? And he said, well, the doctor <laughs> said, as long as you can tolerate the pain, you can play. <laughs> Which if you tell that to a 20 year old male, then what Good they're going to do, do is like try to gut it out. You know, yeah. so I'm hopped up on as many Vioxx and Dars, whatever Darva said or something like that mm. to, to be able to like muscle my way through it partially because I don't have a lot of options, right? Like I, I'm in a situation where uh, I am on a really good basketball team, but if I'm like, ah, I'm not sure about this guys, then they're just going to find the next guy, make my name mud so that I can't go somewhere else. And then that's going to ruin any potential that I have for a professional career. Yeah. Yeah. You leave out of that too, that, uh, the academics are a little bit different. They, they step up a little bit in college too. I don't know what your high school academics were like, but <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, not the, mechanical uh, engineering. My, my, mechanic, at, at Iowa my State. mechanical engineering degree was a little harder than the yeah. uh, Jefferson West diploma. Yeah. To say the least. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Right, so anyway, I think to, to finish that point, I guess, I guess part of the problem is I, I, I struggle sometimes to in talking about this stuff because I know that it's not popular. What people mm. really want if they're casual fans is to just hear like, everybody's so happy to be here. They, there's nowhere they'd rather be. Um, and this is heaven on earth because that's how they kind of imagine it. And yeah. then if you pop a hole in that balloon, then their response, because people don't like cognitive dissonance, is to be like, well, you're the problem. You're mm -hmm. an ungrateful asshole. It's not that I have built up this crazy image of what this world is actually like. Did you get did you get some yeah, pushback? I wonder if there's like a more Go ahead. I was going to say, I wonder if there's more, um, if, if there is more of a pragmatic, realistic view of college sports today than even 10, 15, 20 years ago when, when you were playing, Paul. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I do think that there's a little bit of, it, it's just, it's easier sometimes for us to just like look the other way. Mm -hmm. um, We've gotten used to it, right? Kansas City Chiefs are really good, right? Mm -hmm. The Kansas City Chiefs employ a guy named Tyreek Hill who beat up his pregnant girlfriend at some point, right? Like, and that didn't sit well with me for a while. But now I have like taken, I've just sort of been like, you know what? I just, I can't deal with that. So I'm just going to like pretend that that didn't happen. Um, and so I think that is also true for college sports fans. If they allow themselves to think about it for, for too long, they're going to be like, oh, this, you know, there's there's a seedy underbelly to this. What happened to that guy that we had on the team last year that just like disappeared? He's at some junior college now. What's going to become of his life? I'm not going to think about that. I would rather just think about the here and now. Yeah, it's tough too because I think that people have settled on the easy answer. Like if you just pay all the athletes and and just kind of default to that. And that, you know, I think that there is some validity to that approach, but I think that there are also problems as soon as you start saying, "Hey, let's pay the players," then it's like, "Well, you don't think about again what what's losing out." Now we we can't fund the other programs with that. Uh, it just gets mm -hmm. it just gets complicated. So as long as they've got that default answer though for right now, you can just say, "Well, if we I mean, they should just be paid and it would solve it or they should just go mm -hmm. to the, go straight to the yeah, pros i think it is tricky because uh the, the the universities know that they have a pretty wonderful cash cow um yeah. in that it's not just about like the ticket sales um there is a lot of advantage in being able to see that name see ohio state year after year it just pumped into people's brains that is that's the best kind of advertising there is for the university as a whole not just the sports program right. um and i think you know once you start pulling at this sweater like the threads start to unravel pretty quickly on like well okay well how much is this really worth um there's no way we could actually afford that based on our current model we love having this free advertising so therefore 
we don't want to pay for it. <laughs> I know. I, I saw, I think I saw a Forbes uh, article <clears throat> that might have mentioned you that said that you should have earned something like $440,000 at Iowa State. Not to, not to bring up a sore subject, yeah. but. <laughs> That's a, there's a guy, uh, David Barry, who, um, who writes about, he wrote a book called The Wages of Wins, which yeah. is um, really modeling like uh, what's actually worthwhile. It's, it was kind of early in the, the sports analytics world. Yeah. Um, and so he started extending that back to like what college athletes are actually actually worth. Um, and I think it, you know, that's one thing that does bother me about sports in general, when the owners start trying to be a little Mm. shifty with the way that they kind of don't let on to how much money they're actually making. I remember being in, in Phoenix and, uh, Robert Sarver is, was the new owner of the Phoenix Suns. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't know the numbers on like what he bought the team for versus what it's worth now. But I remember that the year after I was there, so the Suns had gone to the Western Conference Finals. It's, you know, Steve Nash and Amari Stoudemire, 62 and 20 record, best in the NBA. And like day after the last game of the year, we're back in the locker room and he's talking mostly to the guys who matter, which is not me. <laughs> but he writes up on the erase, dry erase board like, OK, so next year, if we want this many wins, it'll probably cost us this many dollars, like more than we're paying this year. And if it's this many wins and it's this many wins. So he's able to break it down for people in a like, well, look, you know, I lo- like I lost three million dollars this year, which on the face <laughs> of it makes sense to us. But you forget that if you buy a team for, let's say, two hundred million dollars and now it's worth a billion dollars, that is a much bigger deal than, than the, three the million. nickel and diming of the year to year. And sometimes owners are able to, like, just slip that past people because mm. it's a little more complicated. Uh, and that is always frustrating to me, not only as a former player, but also just as a fan, because you know that people are just having the wool pulled over their eyes a little we bit. We need a good name for that. We should start calling it the GameStop or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Chucker, bring us back to Iowa State. Bring us back to the sweater so we can get, get uh, back to the comforting sweater. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so, you know... I want to talk about maybe just the end of your college run. And so the 2000, 2001 season, what did you think was kind of next for you? Because it's interesting because your identity is so tied up in being an athlete. Like that's how people know Paul Shirley, even though you got this mechanical engineering degree, like you're known as Paul Shirley, the basketball player. Mm -hmm. Um, So what did you think was kind of next for you? What did you hope was next for you? Well, first of all, I just, I want to say that it's, it's really flattering that, uh, you have that you're this aware of my entire life um i think as i've aged i've realized how um special it is that people give a shit about my life (laughs) right um when you're when i was younger i think i always was like well yeah i'm a professional athlete like of course people are gonna ask me questions (laughs) about this that or the other um and i think we often forget how cool that is that that Mm -hmm. people would know this much about somebody like me um I, my senior year, I was ready to quit basketball forever. I mentioned that I loved Tim Floyd. Uh, I did not love playing for Larry Eustachie. We were really good, but he was not uh, a person who would uh, make you stay in love with the game of basketball. Um, so I was contemplating, uh, I had already actually, my, I, I was at Iowa State for five years and graduated in four and a half and had started my MBA, uh, my spring semester of senior year. Um, thought I was good enough to play professionally, but wasn't really sure because there's no, of course, guarantee. I was applying to grad schools. I was actually thinking about going back to Kansas and maybe just getting an MBA or getting a grad degree in engineering or figuring out whatever came next. Um, I honestly don't know. I think I was I was pretty burnt out and I was just ready to take some time off. Um, what happened after my uh, college career was done, though, was that I went off to the Portsmouth Invitational Tournament. Are you guys? Do you guys know the yeah. Portsmouth? Oh, yeah, that's pretty famous. It's kind of like post collegiate event. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it historically was historically was a bigger deal than even it was by the time I got there. By the time I got there, it was like the guys who were going to be second round picks and play overseas. Yeah, you can't get anybody to come there. Going. Yeah, yeah. But, the first round picks are going somewhere else. They're getting, but they're getting, me- they're getting measured. That's it. We got to make sure the measurements yeah, exactly. are right. <laughs> I went to Portsmouth and I, I just made this decision that I was going to have fun again. Hmm. And not by coincidence, I was so much better all again. <laughs> you know, I just like let go of all of the expectations. And I don't want to, you know, it's not like I was like somehow held in check in college. It's more that I was around guys like Marcus Pfizer and Jamal Tinsley who were going to be the stars and that was fine. And my role, my role was much more like just, you know, score my 10 points and get my seven rebounds or whatever. 
And um, and not to be too like hokey about it, but I remembered why I loved being on the basketball court in the first place. And I think that shone through when I was fielding offers from agents. There were guys who were just like, who is this guy? Like, he's actually like good. Like, we didn't know that this guy was good. Um, so I was able to get an agent I like who was realistic about my prospects. His name's Keith Glass. He had represented a bunch of guys kind of like me who were sort of in between. Um, and... I think we turned the journey into something fun again. Uh, It was the next year I went off to summer league that summer with uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers and then went to training camp, the world champion Los Angeles Lakers. And it was nuts. You know, it was Hmm. Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. And I didn't know what I was doing there exactly. But I also (laughs) knew that somehow the way I played actually almost worked better in the pros than it did in Hmm. college because the game was so much more wide open and it sort of fit with the way that I'd always played. Like I grew up, you, you guys can't see this and people listening can't hear this, but I'm 6'9 and I weigh 230 pounds. And you wouldn't know this, but I was a point guard when I was in eighth and ninth grade. So I had always like seen the court in kind of an open way. And mm. the program was actually, it was just so much more fluid to me than college had been where college basketball just gets so bound up and everybody's like on top of you all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think I understood pretty quickly. Like I remember that you go to, Pardon this brief story, but uh, I went to camp with the Lakers, right? And everybody's like, well, it's, you know, it's a triangle offense. It's pretty complicated. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, let's let's get ready. This is going to be tough. But then you get there and they're like, okay, so if you pass it here, you go here. And then after that, he's going to go there. And I'm like, okay, I got, that's a start. What's next? You're like, no, that's it. (laughs) Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. (laughs) It's interesting. I actually was just tweeting at uh, Rick Buecher, just (laughs) kind of at random. He tweeted something about how somebody had said, like, the NBA has gotten really boring. And he's like, well, yeah, it has. Everybody's, like, at the highest level of athleticism, Mm. but they don't really understand how the game of basketball works exactly. Mm. And so, like, growing up where I grew up, where we just played for hours and hours and hours in the backyard and then, you know, in open gyms or whatever – I just understood how basketball worked. So it wasn't so much that like I was a physically dominant human, but Mm -hmm. I knew I just, it was ingrained in me. Like after watching, you know, you've got the Cameron indoor stadium as your background in our call right now. (laughs) It's me watching big Monday and super Tuesday and like all of these games when I was a kid and just like digesting all of this basketball stuff. And so for that reason, I think getting to the pros, even though I was never going to be, a star in the NBA. It actually just like, it felt, I'm not going to say easy, but it felt like pretty doable compared to the jump from high school to college, which had felt like I'm never going to be able to manage this because everybody's just so big and strong. Suddenly now in the pro game, I was like able to move back outside and like move around and, and use sort of my brain a little bit more. Hmm. Speaking of using your brain, do you think about the role that you played or the opportunity that you had to talk about the pro game? Because I really do, you know, thinking back, I was in grad school reading some of your blogs and just the way in in your book then uh, talking about the pro game. And it really felt like something new to have, again, that behind the curtain. I mean, now you've got all the, the Players' Tribune and all the, everyone's got their own social media. And they're constantly telling us about what's going on or their perspective. But it really mm-hmm. did feel new at that point. I, I don't know if you can, with some time, you've got some perspective on that. But I'm, I'm kind of curious. And if I, I could add to that, Paul, you did that at a point when you'd have retired guys right? autobiographies Mm. or biographies or they'd speak more openly about it but it wasn't as common that you had active players Mm -hmm. people on the bench kind of communicating about what they were seeing and doing and feeling Um, so that's kind of an interesting piece to it i think as well yeah that was probably a mistake by me (laughs) because i i had always thought like the brief version of this is that when i was a senior in college I'd had a friend who um, had gone to Spain to play and he would send out these emails about what it was like. And I, and he was hilarious. And I resolved <laughs> that if I ever got to go play, I would do something similar. And then sure enough, the next year I ended up with these like weird situations where I'm in now playing in Greece after having been cut by the Lakers and we're playing in Jerusalem and <laughs> Poland and Le Mans and all these like just strange things are happening to me. So I started writing them down um, and I had done that for long enough uh, by the time I was playing with the sons and got asked to write a blog for them. 
that I assumed I would write a book when my career was done. But then because the blog sort of exploded, um, Random House called me and asked if I wanted to write a book. And I felt like when you're from a town of 700 people and Random House calls you, you don't say no. You're just like, uh, sure, whatever you guys say. Uh, um, and weirdly, I actually thought this was this was why I'm, I make mistakes in <laughs> career decisions. I thought that that would actually help my standing as a as a basketball player because I, mm. I was like, well, look, you know, teams with their 10th, 11th, 12th guy, if they could get a guy who's like got some notoriety who might bring an extra 50 people to the stadium, that's mm-hmm. better than the other ten, the other team's 10th guy because yeah. like they're, they're, he's they bringing zero people am. to the stadium. <laughs> right. So I thought, well, it's calculated risk. Maybe it'll actually sort of help me in the long run. That was wrong because after I wrote that book, my agent was like, no NBA teams are going to sign you. You're like marginal at best. And now they don't want their secrets told. Mm. Um, so that was a bit of a miscalculation. Um, when it comes to players writing about this stuff, I think I think what helped was that I was, I was so marginal. Um, I had a, a math teacher in college who – would wear the same thing to class every day and we're pretty sure he would just sleep in his clothes and he was not good at personal hygiene but a genius when it came to math he was also the worst teacher i've ever had because he just couldn't understand why we couldn't understand it he was just like well you do this and this and then this is the answer and we're like what no i don't know what you're talking about man and i think that because i you know i'm the best basketball player that a lot of people will ever meet, mm. but I am still in the NBA. I was one of the worst basketball players in the NBA. Even, even when I was like managing to get by, I still was not, you know, going to stick around forever. And so I was able to explain to a person who's outside of the NBA, mm. what it was like to be in the NBA because it was so challenging for me. Um, I think that meant that I could break it down and say like, well, here's what you don't know about the travel. Whereas the NBA guy who has never considered that travel wouldn't be this way. (laughs) Can't really break that down because I'd been in the CBA and staying in the Cedars Inn and suites in Yakima, Washington as my place of residence, making $600 a week. (laughs) I was able to be like, holy shit, can you believe that we get to stay in a Ritz-Carlton tonight? This <laughs> yeah. is crazy, which is what you guys would have as your response yes. as well. And so people are able to relate to that. Whereas Amari Stoudemire, who was drafted out of Nowheresville, but is vaulted immediately to the NBA, didn't have to go through all of those other steps. And so he hasn't got the perspective mm-hmm. for why this would be a big deal to someone that's just in a fan's shoes. Hmm. That's good. <laughs> You know, um, so, Paul, you begin your professional career overseas and then you kind of mentioned these these NBA stops in Phoenix, Atlanta, Chicago, and then you got a lot of basketball globetrotting in there. So sticking on that NBA experience, because you talked about kind of like giving that voice and kind of communicating how things were kind of different with your NBA experience. What was most surprising to you? And then also what was most disenchanting to you? Probably the same answer. Um, so, you know, I mentioned growing up in a little tiny town in Kansas, reading all these books and, and a lot of the books I would read would be sports biographies, right? So I would read about Mickey Mantle or Joe DiMaggio or what, whomever else, a lot of Yankees apparently. Um, <laughs> and what I took from those was this idea that in whatever, 1927 or 1945, these baseball teams would travel around together. And it was just like a bunch of dudes who were all in on like, we just want to have a great team. And then we're going to go like celebrate afterwards and have dinners and then go on to the next city. And I think I was always sort of searching for that in my career. Um, I found it actually overseas, but definitely did not find it in the NBA. Hmm. Uh, I think in the NBA, it was more like miniature corporations, sort of just, it it was almost like, like each NBA team's an incubator in Hmm. startup land. And there's like all these Hmm. little companies in there and they're all trying to like kind of coexist, but they're not completely on board with one another. Um, and, And, you know, that again, that's personal experience, but it was pretty consistent most of the places that I went. Um, I, I did find in Europe that it was just a little easier to kind of to jump in and feel like you were all in it together. And I think some of that is the hardship 
And when I say hardship, getting that paid fifty percent of your salary, very <laughs> loosely. Like, yeah, it's not like it's, you know, digging ditches, as oh, my dad yeah. would say. Yeah, yeah. But there's something about like you know, in Europe we'd have roommates and mm. we'd have to eat together, and we're traveling on commercial flights where we don't sit first class. We're just amongst the rest of everybody else, right? And as you know, annoying as that was when it when you when I would go from like my brief stop in the NBA where everything's taken care of to this European world, I'd be like, oh, this is, this is tough. <laughs> Little did I know, right? Yeah. Like how luxurious that really is. But I think that breeds a sense of camaraderie and it democratizes the team. Whereas in the NBA, it, it really is just these like individual entities. And I honestly, I think that's one of the things that people react to when it comes to do you watch college basketball or do you watch the NBA? Yeah. You know, there are a lot of NBA fans, of course, but I think college basketball still wins out in a lot of cases because people can kind of feel that passion and the, just the connectedness of the players to each other because they're going through something difficult. That's challenging because, as I said earlier, it's – it, you do remove some of the agency of the players in the way that we set this up. But it feels more pure. Yeah, but it feels like these guys actually care. And, mm. you know, again, in the NBA, they, they do care to some degree. But I think there's there uh, there's just so – it's so sterile. And that's mm. what was really frustrating to me it was just like I thought – there was just going to be more like connection. I mean, it, again, not to sound too hokey, but I think we're all searching for a connection, mm -hmm. right? We want like people who are on our side. I was always stunned even in college at like, what, like we're here to try to get better together. Cause we love this game. Right. <laughs> and so why is it so hard for you guys to show up on time for practice <laughs> or class or like, the whole idea was to get here and then like go beat Kansas. Like what, uh, anything that gets in the way of that is the wrong. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I was always frustrated and I think it, it made me a little bit jaded that like there were just so few people I found that were kind of on the same page it's, about that. It's weird too, because those Suns teams, I would think about like connectedness and I, uh, it's odd to hear that because they seem like, you know, one of the most connected NBA teams that I, that I saw from that era. And it just, I, I do see what you're saying though. And, and it, it maybe even seems more so now that each player is their own like entity. People, fans have almost gravitated to the players rather than the, the teams on the NBA level. Whereas in college basketball, it definitely is still the team is association first. Yeah. And I, you know, smarter people than, than us have talked about how the NBA has, has gone all in on marketing the individual over mm -hmm. the team, which I think is a mistake because the individual will let you down, not because they're a bad person, but because they blow out their Achilles. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the reasons that people love the NFL is that it doesn't really matter who's under the helmet. I'm mm -hmm. rooting for the helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, and baseball is a little bit that way. I think, I think baseball weirdly right now is doing this thing where they're like, we need to celebrate the individual more. And you're like, no, no. don't. Cause <laughs> you know, dude, dude's going to blow out his rot rotator cuff yeah. and then you're not going to have him tomorrow market anymore uh, yeah um i think i think that's where where college succeeds right like you're if you're if you went to ohio state you're rooting for ohio state you don't really care mm -hmm. who's playing for them and that i think just stands the test of time when it comes to that Suns team i do think like a lot of credit goes to steve nash for being able to rally a sense of that hmm. like it you know Interesting. it's not it's not there were guys on that team who were kind of in like yeah. weirdly quentin richardson was one of those dudes who like as huh. as good coaches i've had would say you won on your side in a bar fight like mm -hmm. he's one of those dudes who's just like he'll do whatever to <laughs> help the team win um i think amari stoudemire at that point was young enough where he like would kind of do whatever steve mm -hmm. nash said uh but then you still have like to, still together you know, right Moskal, who's like a re religious fundamentalist and sean mm. marion can't spell his own name so like <laughs> that you know those guys are not really necessarily on board they're just like <laughs> hovering around mm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's flip back to co college then. So I want to get uh, tournament, God willing, is uh, going to happen this year. Give us your one shining moment, like a tournament moment that you remember the most that you, if you are sitting back in, in 20 more years from now, you're going to be uh, 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 reminiscing about. Mine are all bad. Mine are all sad moments. <laughs> well, that, but I mean, that's, that's part why of the they tournament, go in the one right? shining that's moment. A, yeah, it's only yeah, one, that's, one, that's one team. That's why they go in the one 
Yeah. The one shining Sometimes moment. Sometimes the bad moments create some, uh, you know, some create some drama. good yeah. moments. Yeah. My, uh, so my freshman year, uh, as I mentioned, Iowa State goes to Sweet 16, but I, I didn't play. So that was that was more just like me watching. Um, my junior year, we, of course, famously lost to Michigan State mm. in the Elite Eight. Um, and that was that will always be burned into the minds of Iowa State fans because it happened in part because of this – controversial double foul Oof. that I was a part of um, where it, it, Charlie Bell who <laughs> played for Michigan State had it, very end of the game kind of like gotten underneath me right as I went up for the shot after Jamal Tinsley had passed me the ball <laughs> there's a lot of other dramatic circumstances in that I had I had not really played for three or four weeks because I'd broken my foot uh, mm. in, a, in a conference game against Texas I think it was um and so I'm all hopped up again on painkillers. <laughs> this time they actually, you know, shots in my ass to oh my allow God. me to be able to play. So my uh, leg was numb, but I'd played okay. And like my uncle had flown to Auburn Hills to watch the game. And it's, it's in Auburn Hills, Michigan. So Michigan state has 20,000 of their fans there. And we have 2000 of our fans <laughs> anyway. So the shot goes up and, uh, goes in and there's a foul called and the ref calls a block on Charlie Bell. And I'm like, Oh my God, there's two minutes left and we're about to go up by seven or whatever the number was five. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure after I make this free throw, but then another ref comes over and he's like, no, I got a charge on the Iowa state guy. And so they huddle up and they huddle up and they huddle up. And then they decide to call a double foul, which <laughs> effectively doesn't exist. Right? Like you have to go one way or the other. Yeah. Made um, it up. So on the double foul, I fouled out oh. and Michigan state got the ball and basket was waved off. So they go down and throw an alley-oop to Morris Peterson, and the crowd goes crazy, and we lose the game. Larry Stacey gets ejected, which is the most I've ever liked him because he was just, <laughs> he was just, he felt. If you've got to get I mean, ejected, Stacey, that was the, that was the yeah, time. Yeah, for all you Stacey's faults, I did appreciate, he always had like an inferiority complex, like everybody was trying to screw us, which was kind of true. I mean, nobody really wanted Iowa State to beat Michigan State in, and then go to the Final Four. But anyway, so, point of the story though is i get back to ames iowa and as i mentioned i'm playing on this broken foot so even though we've lost and i'm very sad um i'm like well at least i get to rest but something that has happened at the end of this game was because i was prone to crying at the end of games i had started <laughs> crying like i always did when we lost a big game and there'd been a lot of time where eustachy was getting thrown out so there are a lot of opportunities for people to take photographs and so this picture of me existed <laughs> where i'm on the end of the bench looking real sad and pale just your perfect like ncaa shot yeah. and so i get back to ames and my mom's like hey isn't this cool your picture's in the paper in la and detroit and i'm like not that cool but okay so i get through this weekend fine and then monday morning i wake up and i'm like you know what that was a hell of a weekend we had we had quite a run i've still got my senior year to come and at least i'm not going to be in pain today because my you know foot won't hurt as much because i don't have to practice on it spring day at iowa state only five weeks school left like let's dig into you know finishing up the school year walk to campus to get breakfast and there on the front page of the iowa state daily not just on it but the entire front page is is my face crying <laughs> and i remembered like being like you know i could just go back to bed because i don't need this in my life but i was like you know what paul don't take yourself so seriously so i soldiered through went to breakfast you know, everybody's pointing and laughing and I'm <laughs> trying to chuckle along. And then I'm sitting in the parks library on the campus of Iowa State and studying. And this girl comes over and she's like, hey, are you Paul Shirley? And I said, yeah. And she's like, would you sign this? And it was at that moment that I understood the disconnect between the fan and the player. She if only it had been a bib. If this, only she like, had that, a bib. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you don't understand that that's me. I'm yeah. very sad. Like, I'm not really too interested in revisiting that, but that was not on her mind. Oh, no. But did you get her number? <laughs> Great question. And the answer is probably no. <laughs> I could have made it all better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Paul, thank you so much for the time. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit uh, have the chucker hit some of the rapid fire questions here as we uh, wrap thing wrap things up, and then I'll uh, outro us. But so appreciate you coming on, it made me laugh again. We love we love doing this stuff, and uh, just looking forward to reading the rest of uh, your book. Where, where where can you find the book? So it's on Amazon. I saw. Are there are there other places you want to plug to get Ball Boy? In the in the times we live in, just go to Amazon. Amazon. All right. 
Amazon, yeah, Amazon Walmart. Amazon, that's a, that's Amazon. a link. Yeah. Yep. Love that's it. the way to go. All right. Yeah. Love but it. Thank you. I, I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So like he, uh, like Aaron said, uh, the trucker is going to take you out with some nice run and gun rapid fire questions. All right, Paul. So let's take yeah. Hilton magic off the table. What's mm. the coolest gym you played in? Allen field house. Good, good answer. Only because you got to stare down Roy Williams. Though. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's no there's nothing like the sheer decibel level of Allen uh, Fields. Yeah. People forget a lot of bleachers in there, so you actually pack people in even closer than you would. It's not like a monolith. Like Hilton Coliseum is is really loud, but it's all like individual padded seats, which yeah. is it's glorious. But Allen Fieldhouse is like comparatively small and holds so many more people. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that Jayhawk is massive on the court. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Favorite uniform from your time at Iowa State? Uh, we had a lot of bad ones. Um, <laughs> so that is tough. We did have one. I think my, I think it might have been my red shirt year. We, for some reason, they got real serious about the design because it had been so awful the year before. And there was some talk of like it was designed by like somebody who had worked at like Ralph Lauren or something. There was a lot more <laughs> navy blue in it than um, have to is check that normally out. in Iowa State stuff, which you guys appreciate this. Iowa State has taken to doing this thing where they have black uniforms, and I think it is dreadful. Here's why. You get to – okay, so let's say you're um, – well, let's say you're Ohio State, and you really only have one color – if you wore black with that color, okay. But you're, if you're Iowa State, you've got red and gold. Those are your two choices. Yeah. Like when you you've you've committed to these two choices. Okay. Another example: <laughs> Oklahoma. They have one color. It's that like sort of uh, purpley red, mm-hmm. red, right? If Oklahoma black had black uniforms, you'd be like, that kind of makes sense because they can offset just this one color with an offsetting color. Right. But Iowa State just what are you it's, doing? <laughs> It looks really pretty, but then if you want black to be your color, then pick black as your color. End of tirade. Yep. Fair, fair. I love, I love a little uniform breakdown. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the 99 fans will appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about the team you least enjoyed playing. Uh, in college? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Let's stick with the ISU time. Um, the University of Iowa. And why so? They ran the flex offense, which Ooh. is annoying. Yeah. Oh, horrible. Yeah. Horrible. And they also had a lot of dudes that were almost criminals that would just like, <laughs> like, it seemed like their entire job was to just like get tangled with you all the time. Like Ugh. Jacob Jakes was this guy who I'm sure I would get along with well now. I don't yeah. mean, I'm sure he's not a bad dude, but like his entire existence was just like getting his arm up under your armpit. <laughs> they had uh, Reggie Evans who was oh, a pain yes. in the ass. Oh. He, he would actually, he continued he, that I the remember NBA. vividly. He uh, put his finger into my butthole on purpose <laughs> so that I, he could get a rebound. That's, that's that commitment you were looking for earlier, Shirley. I hate to that's tell true. you. Yeah, I, you were, yeah, you were I looking sure. for that. Yeah, that. yeah I should. Uh, I, again, I probably would get along Great with Reggie. Teammate. I just yeah. didn't like playing. Yeah. All right. So we talked about the team you least enjoyed playing. We know you enjoyed beating Kansas. But mm-hmm. let's take Kansas off the table, a team you mm-hmm. took great pride in beating that it felt like maybe not just you personally, because the Kansas thing felt personal. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but at, when you were at Iowa State, was there a team that you guys when you guys would beat, you thought, yeah, we, we like to beat those dudes. That's cool. Uh, Missouri, probably. So Missouri was still in the Big 12 at that point, And they were like it's so I think that's one of the mistakes that a lot of these uh conferences have made and like realignments like you you take away these storylines and missouri was always the villain in all of the big eight and big 12 um and i think that was still true when i was at iowa state so they had uh, norm stewart was their coach my first couple years and then quinn snyder took over and quinn snyder's had a lot of success at, at utah but mm-hmm. at the time he was a pretty boy nobody liked him he, <laughs> he seemed a little too glam he came from duke Yep, yeah. <laughs> came, came from Duke. Uh, so I think I think it was it was fun to beat Missouri because they seemed like a villain. Mm, I love it. Gotcha. Uh, most impressive opponent. There, I'm looking for a specific player who really impressed. Um, always hated guarding Nick Collison in college <laughs> because mm. he was um, he was like me only better. <laughs> so, so it was, it was like just reminding like, you. Oh man, I could be slightly better <laughs> if I were just like Nick Collison. But I was actually done a great favor by Nick Collison because he didn't come to Iowa State. He was committed to Iowa State, but when Coach Floyd oh, uh, yeah, left the Bulls, right. he decommitted 
uh, and chose to go to Kansas. Gotcha. And did, was you know, where was guys, Heinrich headed? He was going. Was he going to Iowa or Iowa State too? No, he was coming to Iowa State also. Wow. He would have been real good. Yeah, oh, wow. I wouldn't have gotten to play as much. Yeah. but we would have been really good. Yeah, <laughs> might not have been crying on that on the front of that paper. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, there's some guys who carry with them a lot of hype, and then you get on the court with them, and you're like, really? So who was the most overhyped guy you played against? Uh, now I'm going to skip to not quite the pro, but sort of summer league, first year out of college, um, playing against Tyson Chandler. Mm. Uh, he hadn't figured out that he didn't know how basketball works yet. <laughs> uh, and so he was out on the wing trying to like make moves. <laughs> and I remember being like, wow, this guy is bad. But I assumed he was really good because he was whatever, the second pick. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about it. I mean, these poor kids, like 19 years old or something, and I'm whatever at this point, 22 or 23. Yeah. Um, just like so easy to stop because he just didn't know how basketball worked yet. Mm. Crazy. Gotcha. And sticking on that note a little bit, maybe a guy you're surprised, guy you played against, and this could be in college, and let's maybe even push overseas too. But a guy you're surprised maybe did, didn't carve out more of a successful professional career. Well, this guy, so this guy had a really successful European career, but never really stuck in the NBA. His name's Andy Panko. Hmm. Um, he scored so many points in Spain, which is the second best league in the world. Um, I think he played at a div, maybe a division three school in Pennsylvania and played a little bit in the NBA, but just one of those guys who like just knows how to score. And if you can put it in the basket, usually it works out. I think he was actually, if he had, if he had come around now, he would have been better off. But hmm. at the time, he was just like, well, I don't know what position we play him in. Now they would just say, who cares what position he is? He, he's like, a bucket. Let him shoot three. It would yeah. be fine. Yeah. Love it. All right. All right, Paul. Let's end it there and uh, let you get on with your day. Thanks to Paul Shirley for sharing with us current successes, past recollections at Iowa State. We'd love to have you on again. We didn't even get to some of the things. I, I wanted to talk more about the process, which is your screen name on here. Uh, I I'm, mm, I'm going to yeah. look more into that uh, too myself um, this summer when I've got a little uh, time away from my uh, prim good, primary good. job. Well, I'm actually really yeah, interested the, uh, in that. The, the next thing that will come is um, – I'm working on a book called The Process is the Product, which is all about how it's a little bit about what I talked about. Like we all have to fall in love with the process. It's not it's never going to feel great that good enough on the day that your book comes out yeah. to warrant all of the stuff that goes into it. The only thing that feels good enough is the day to day of the doing it. I, I love that. I heard, I heard you talking about that before. It, it really did uh, mean a lot to me to, to just hear about like the work that goes into it being as important as the, the thing that you produce at the end of it. And I think that that goes in, in so many things in life, right? Yeah, well, for well, sure. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm honored to get to talk about some of this stuff. Hopefully again. Uh, if you haven't yet, we got that Iowa state gear on, on the, on the way. So the, it, it will be a, a nice, saw... nice colors. Uh, so not what we won't have okay. a black, no black t-shirt on the way nope, for no you. Black I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks guys. All right, man. All right. All right. Thank you for listening to the 199 podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, make sure you do. And while you're at it, leave us a rating or review. It helps keep us going. We also have links to all of 199 social media so you never miss a release. Until next time.